Good afternoon, and welcome to our study of Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. Before we dive into the text, I'd just like to pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you especially for your word made flesh, Jesus. We thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit who brings clarity and insight as we read your word. And we just pray now, Lord, in these next few moments as we look at chapters 3 and 4 of Hebrews, that your Holy Spirit will inspire us, will challenge us, exhort us, and draw us closer to you. In your name we pray. Amen. So, I'm going to read the first six verses of chapter 3. Here we go. Therefore, brothers and sisters, holy partners in a heavenly calling, consider that Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. Yet Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder of a house has more honour than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that would be spoken later. Christ, however, was faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if we hold firm the confidence and the pride that belong to hope. So not for the first time, uh, a paragraph begins with the word therefore. So that means that the author is saying, in light of what we have just heard, this is what comes next. So he's been talking about Jesus uh, as the high priest. And now he goes on to talk a little bit about Moses. But remember, the whole uh, trajectory of the letter to the Hebrews so far has been to encourage us to understand the preeminence of Jesus. And here, uh, the author talks about the, the preeminence of Jesus by comparing him, if you will, with Moses. Now, it doesn't, dim it doesn't diminish in any way uh, Moses' position, but rather it allows Moses to take his rightful place. You see, Moses, in leading God's people from slavery and then delivering God's law to them, played an essential role in the plans of God. But those were always intended to be signposts pointing the way to Jesus. And the author says, uh, Jesus is the apostle and the high priest of our confession. If you think about the, the role of an apostle, it's to deliver the good news of the gospel. But here the author is telling us that Jesus doesn't simply deliver the good news of the gospel, he is the good news of the gospel. Salvation is in him. So that's his apostolic role, if you will. And as high priest, he is the one perfectly qualified to stand in the presence of God, interceding on our behalf. And we'll look more again at his role of high priest later on. The author also talks about the heavenly calling. He makes that statement in verse 1. But that's not simply a call to go to heaven, which is the ultimate destination of all believers, but it's a call from heaven a call to enter into the full and free life provided by Jesus. And the people who make up this community of believers, um, the author starts to describe uh, as a house. And he, he's saying this house, um, the, this community of believers are invited to live as those who really believe that God's new world broke into history with the coming of Jesus. And for that reason, for those of us who've placed our, our trust in him and our hope in him, we should be brimming over with confidence and pride. 
Now in the secular world, uh, confidence and pride might have somewhat of a negative connotation, but the confidence and pride that the author to the Hebrews is talking of have nothing to do with arrogance or presumption. Rather they are to do with the, the, the bubbling over of cheerfulness and joy as we embrace this truth of the amazing gift of Jesus. And that's the trajectory that we're on, uh, growing daily in our understanding of the Lord and his ways, uh, which will ultimately be fulfilled when we go to be with him. But the markers or the, the evidence of what be, we believe should be present in our lives today. I'm reminded that in Acts chapter 2, in the later verses, uh, 43 through 47, it speaks of the compelling witness of the lives of the early church. It says that many were added to their number day by day because of the, the way in which these early Christians led their lives. And so the first question, I think, that these, these verses place before us um, is this, is the way that I'm leading my life pointing others towards seeking a relationship with the Lord? When people look at my life and yours, are they compelled to ask the question, what is it that you've got that I am looking for? So let's move on to verses 7 through uh, to the end of the, the chapter. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors put me to the test, though they had seen my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation. And I said, they always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. As in my anger I swore, they will not enter my rest. Take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you may have an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partners of Christ, if only we hold our first confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Now who were they who heard and yet were rebellious? Was it not those who left Egypt under the leadership of Moses? But with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, if not to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Okay, now having spoken about Moses and uh, identified the preeminence of Jesus, the author now turns his attention to Israel's 40 years in the wilderness. And he makes uh, a direct quotation from Psalm 95. Now, if you look at Psalm 95, uh, you will see that it begins as a call to worship. For the first seven verses, it's a call to praise and worship. And then suddenly there, there's a change uh, in verse eight of Psalm 95 when the author recalls the time when people who had been freed by God from slavery started to rail and grumble against him, showing their displeasure and mistrust of him, even though they had experienced firsthand the miraculous work of God, not simply once or twice, but multiple times in their deliverance from Egyptian slavery. And so when things became challenging for the children of Israel on their way to the promised land, they started to harden their heart towards God. And in doing so, 
they paid the ultimate penalty. They forfeited the opportunity to enter in to the promised land. So what the author to the Hebrews wants us to recognize, as well as his original audience, is that Jesus sets us free, but that walking with the Lord requires intent. Now, earlier on in, uh, in chapter two, the author has warned his listeners against drifting. Now what he's doing is letting them know that the next step along the way, having drifted from the Lord, having turned sideways to him, if you like, the next step is the hardening of the heart. Basically deciding if the Lord doesn't come through for me in the way that I expect or demand, then I'm not going to follow him. And the author uses this word today twice in verse 7 and 13. And he's emphasizing to the Christian community that today is the day to follow Jesus, to live this day as one who has placed his or her trust entirely into the hands of the Lord. But we have to be aware that hardness of heart is a real possibility if we stop seeking to walk with the Lord, if we stop seeking to cultivate that relationship. And then in verses 14 through 19, uh, the author puts an exclamation point at the end of the chapter by reminding the Hebrews of three things. First of all, the ones who rebelled were the very ones who God had set free from slavery. They had seen the plagues visited upon Pharaoh's people. They had been the recipients of the grace of the Passover feast. They had been led by the, the pillar of cloud during the day and the pillar of fire by night. They had seen God part the Red Sea so that they could walk in freedom from the Egyptians. Yet it was those very same people who had witnessed all of those miracles who rebelled against God the minute they felt things were not working out entirely to their liking. Remember, there came a point in their wilderness journey when they started to long for the, the flesh pots of, of Egypt. Um, so the warning is clearly there. When we follow the Lord, it has to be intentional. And then he goes on to say that um, their deliberate, their willful rebellion breaks the heart of God. And there's a consequence for that. And I think we have to be careful not to, to water down the gospel. And, and we have to be bold enough to say that if we stop following the Lord, if we start holding a pity party because things don't go our own way, there are consequences for that. So our intentional uh, walk of faith on a daily basis is really, really important. I'm going to read a quote from N.T. Wright, um, talking of this uh, tendency or this risk, if you will, of the uh, turning away from the Lord. He says this, that's the ever-present danger which faced Christians in the first century and it faces us today as well. Once you stop believing, either in the God who called you, rescues you and guides you, you simply go round and round in the wilderness, never getting anywhere. Now, in chapter four, he builds on what he's already said and starts with another therefore. So we have to have in our mind, in the light of what took place in the wilderness and the hardness of heart and the disobedience of the Israelites, this is the consequence. So I'm just going to read verses uh, 1 through 11 in chapter 4. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest is still open, let us take care that none of you should seem to have failed to reach it. 
For indeed the good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard didn't benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said, as in my anger I swore they shall not enter my rest, though his works were finished at the foundation of the world. For in one place it speaks about the seventh day as follows, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place it says, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains open for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news fail to enter because of disobedience, again he sets a certain day, today, saying through David, much later, in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God wouldn't speak later about another day. So then a Sabbath rest still remains for the people of God. For those who enter God's rest also cease from their labours, as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one may fall through such disobedience as theirs. There's a lot going on there, um, but basically what I would like to unpack in the next few minutes is this idea of the rest of God and how it's possible to miss out on the rest of God. The opening statement in verse 1 makes it clear that the rest of God is available, but care must be taken not to forfeit it or miss out on it. And again, the author draws a parallel to the children of Israel. They were released from captivity in Egypt. And though the promise of journeying into the promised land was always before them, there was a generation of God's people who never entered the promised land, who never entered the rest of God. Now, in Exodus uh, chapter 19, and I'll read a few verses from that, specifically Exodus chapter 19 and verses 3 through 6. This is what it says. Now, therefore, this is the Lord speaking through Moses. If you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. There's a description there of God's intention for his people, uh, an intention for them to flourish. And it's contingent upon one thing and one thing alone, being in relationship with him. It sounds as though it's transactional. If you do this, for me, I'll do this for you. But that's to, to put a human interpretation on the idea. You see, God placed before his children an opportunity to walk in daily relationship with him. No questions asked. But the, the Israelites turned it into a transactional relationship. Um, Things are not going well for us. Therefore, we are not going to follow you. We demand quail. We demand food other than this manna you have provided. You see, there's this constant mistrust, this distrust and suspicion of God's motives. And humans turn their relationship with God into something that is transactional. And yet the Lord always wants our relationship with him to be built on getting to know each other as fully as we possibly can. So even though the Israelites had experienced the mighty works of God, they didn't appropriate his truth and his goodness and his love and his mercy in their hearts. And instead of exercising faith in God, the one who'd released them from captivity in the first place, they just complain against him. They, they uh, display their mistrust 
of him. And there's, a, there's another point there for us, I think. You see, for you and for me, exercising trust in God is a daily decision. And it's one which we're encouraged to practice in any and all circumstances. It doesn't speak to a very robust faith if we're able to say, I really trust in you, Lord, when things are going my way. But I'm not so sure when the tide turns against me. When we take that stance, we're displaying the same heart of mistrust that the um, Israelites displayed. And the consequence of that was that they never entered the literal promised land, the land of rest. So let's talk a little bit more about the rest of God. You see, for those who accept Jesus, entry into the rest of God is made available. But it's very important that we define our understanding of rest here. It's appropriate to ask the question, is that rest that the author to the Hebrews is talking about, is it a rest that God bestows upon us? Or is it the rest that God himself enjoys? Well, in the next few moments, I hope to show that it's both of those. It's both a bestowed rest and an enjoyed rest. And by way of illustration, um, the author refers not for the first time to the creation narrative. So I'm just going to read from uh, Genesis chapter 2 and read a couple of verses from there. Genesis chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3 says this, And on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. So, there is a Sabbath rest. Uh, that's a rest that God himself uh, demonstrated. And I think it's really important that we understand the importance of Sabbath rest. Um, we probably don't live in a day and an age now where we set aside one day a week from resting for our labours. I can remember growing up back in, in England um, Sunday was a Sabbath day. The only thing you did on Sunday was go to church and you ate your meals, but the rest of the day was spent at home. You, If you're an adult, you didn't go out and, and do the, the yard work. If you're a kid like me, you weren't even allowed to go outside and play. Um, it was a type of literal Sabbath rest ceasing from labours. And I think it's important that we cultivate Sabbath rest in our own lives. There are very few of us, I would imagine, that can set aside 24 hours uh, as a sustained period to do that. But being intentional about setting aside time just to sit quietly, to sit with nothing other than your thoughts, um, inviting the Holy Spirit to, to minister to you and speak to you is really, really important. But because of the, uh, the age in which we live and the pace at which we tend to live our lives, we have to fight for that Sabbath rest. But I think it's important. So that's a rest modelled by God that we are invited to engage with by an act of our will. Then there's also um, the type of rest which might be best characterised as not living our lives in a state of frantic anxiety. This is not a call for us to cease from our labours, but rather it is for us to experience the rest that comes from complete trust that we are where God wants us, 
doing what he wants us to do on this particular day. You see, if I start worrying about what tomorrow holds or what next week holds or where will I be in a, a month's time or six months time or a year's time from now, I begin to live for tomorrow instead of living for today. And once that gets out of control, I start living in an anxious state, wondering about what the future holds. Is my currently pretty good health going to hold up? Is it not? What's that going to look like? We are not modeling the rest that God makes available to us when we live in a heightened state of frantic anxiety. So the rest that I'm talking about here is different from Sabbath rest, which is a ceasing from labors. This rest is not living our lives in a state of frantic anxiety, but trusting entirely that we are where God wants us to be in this moment, doing all that we can to fulfill his purposes for us in this moment. So that's the second type of rest. And then um, the author starts to talk about um, Joshua. Why does he do that? Well, Joshua, as you will remember, is the one who succeeded Moses, who never entered the promised land, as we, as we know. He viewed it from afar, but he never actually crossed over into Canaan. Joshua was the one who succeeded Moses and led the tribes of Israel across the Jordan and into Canaan. Now he clearly wasn't leading them into a place of cessation from their labors. Um, it was a land of rest because it's where God wanted them to be but there were still battles to be won. You remember the classic case of the Israelites having to march around the city of Jericho so that its walls would fall down and the city could be taken. So it wasn't a rest um, that was a cessation from work or effort. And the author says that um, it wasn't Joshua that gave them rest. There's another type of rest that is being talked about and ultimately that is eternal rest. Now eternal rest comes when as believers we go to be with Jesus. That's when eternal rest if you will is perfected. But the author says something very interesting. He says let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. So what is this, this rest that we're, we're meant to enter into? And doesn't it sound somewhat contradictory to say that we are to make every effort to enter into any kind of rest? It sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? Expending any type of effort to gain rest. But I think it's the rest that we are able to enjoy as we deepen our understanding of the Lord and intentionally cultivate our relationship with him. It's that sense of I'm utterly convinced that when the Lord calls me home that's exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to be with him and we are invited while we're still in this uh, earthen vessel, if you like, this, this uh, mortal body that we currently occupy, we are invited to taste of that truth now and to somehow embody it. I've had the great fortune of, of being alongside people um, shortly before they were called home to go be with the Lord. And there's been this incredible sense of peace uh, and joy flowing from them because they were resting uh, in the arms of Jesus in their earthly form, 
knowing that they were literally going to be with him in very short order. But I don't think we have to wait until we're days or, or weeks away from our physical death, and none of us knows when that's going to be anyway. But I think knowing the rest of God, this eternal rest of God that is our destiny, the thumbprints of that rest should be on our lives here and now. So just to recap, the, the three types of rest that Hebrews reveals to us. There is Sabbath rest, ceasing from our labours. There is the rest that is characterised by not living our lives in a state of frantic anxiety and worry about the future. And then there's the eternal rest that we are calling, we are being called to, but which we, we should show evidence of our hope and our faith in that rest should come cascading through into our lives and spill out into the way uh, we lead our lives here and now. The next two verses are very well known. Verses 12 and 13. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. God's word is indeed living. It's effective. It diagnoses the condition and the need of every human heart and also the deepest recesses of every human heart, uh, even those areas that we may not be personally aware of. And as we ponder this word of God, this Logos word of God, the written word of God, we must also remember that Jesus is this word made flesh. Um, it's really important that we understand what the, the writer to the Hebrews is saying here. There's the Logos word which is life-giving in and of itself. I hope each one of us has those experiences where we're reading God's word and suddenly we're, we're inspired or, or maybe we're cut to the heart and convicted um, it's an evidence when those things happen um, that this word to the Hebrews is true. The word of God, the written word of God, the logos of God is living and active. But then, of course, we've got Jesus. In John's gospel, he's referred to as the word made flesh. And what I would what what I want to say about that is that we are invited to feast on the written word of God and also to feast on this beautiful Jesus with whom we're invited to have this deep relationship. I will refer you to uh, the prophet Isaiah. There's a beautiful passage there which I would encourage anyone to read and meditate on. Uh, the subtitle for Isaiah chapter 55 in uh, my Bible says an invitation to an abundant life. If you want to be inspired uh, and envisioned with what the abundant life looks like in the here and now, but also in the age to come, I would, I would encourage you to read Isaiah chapter 55. But about two thirds of the way through the chapter, this is what the prophet says. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. 
seems to me that there are two things going on there. First of all, that God's word will do everything it's intended to. But, and there's an important but here, it's up to us as individuals to engage with that word. Uh, Eugene Peterson wrote a book called Eat This Book. <laughs> and it was, a, it was really an invitation to become increasingly immersed in the truth uh, contained in our Bibles. We all know that our Bibles, right from the first to the last word, point to the person of Jesus Christ. So there is an invitation to feast on this written word. And as we feast on this written word, we grow in our relationship with he who is the word made flesh, Jesus. And what the author to the Hebrews is basically saying is if you've accepted this wonderful Saviour, don't turn your backs on him. Don't even turn your shoulder to him, but rather pursue him with all that you've got. And then in the closing verses of uh, chapter 4, the author returns to the theme of Jesus as high priest, not for the first time nor for the last time. And we may wonder why he speaks so often about Jesus as high priest. I would simply say this, if he felt it important enough to talk on multiple occasions about Jesus as his role as high priest, then it was important uh, and we should take note as well. But this is what God's word says, verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. In chapter 2, Jesus was referred to as a merciful and faithful high priest. Now the author is showing that Jesus is the one, the only one in fact, from whom we can receive everything that we need in order to continue this journey of faith so that we don't fall back into any form of enslavement. Now the description of Jesus passing through the heavens is what sets him apart from the earthly high priests. This is made more explicit in chapter 5, which we'll look at next week. But suffice to say that Aaron, the first high priest, um, and subsequent high priests, on one day of the year, on the Day of Atonement, they went into the Holy of Holies and passed through the inner veil in order to be as close as they could be to the presence of God, in order to make confession for themselves, and to make sacrifice for themselves, as well as confession and sacrifice for the people. But Jesus, as high priest, doesn't pass through a temporal veil. He enters into heaven itself, and there represents and intercedes for his people. You see, in Jesus, we have a high priest with unparalleled capacity for empathizing and understanding all, all of life's dangers and sorrows and trials. And because of that fact, again, that word therefore, in other words, knowing that Jesus is in this exalted place and that he is the perfect high priest, we should approach the throne of grace boldly and confidently because that's where Jesus is 
longing to commune with us, longing to intercede on our behalf. Interestingly, thinking about the Holy of Holies in the temple, it was at the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies that the work of atonement was completed. But we, through Jesus, have ongoing access to the mercy, grace and help of our Lord. Not only in times of crisis, but I think especially in times of crisis. Now one of the sad facts of our lives as believers, and we have to be very alert to this, you see the enemy would have us believe that in times of crisis, when the tide metaphorically seems to be always turning against us, the enemy would have us believe that it's at those times that the Lord has either lost interest in us, he's grown impatient with us, or worse still, he doesn't really care about us and that we have every right to turn our back on him. But remember the warnings that have been given uh, about the, the children of Israel in the wilderness. That's exactly what their posture was and they forfeited their rest in the Lord. You see, the truth is that in times of trial and crisis, the Lord delights in his people seeking him out. I know the Lord is very pleased when I'm overcome by beauty in nature or, or anything that's wonderfully positive going on in my life. And there are so many blessings that are. But he's equally pleased when I share my times of desperation, when I share my times of concern with him. He loves it when his people seek him out, whether we're having a mountaintop experience or whether we're having a deepest valley experience, because, because the Lord wants relationship with us. And genuine relationship comes when we share life together. And that's what the Lord wants for us. One of my favourite uh, books, in fact my favourite book in the uh, Narnia series by C.S. Lewis, is the third in the series. It's the uh, one entitled The Horse and His Boy. And I know many of you have read it, but what always moves me every time I read this particular passage the story is about a, a little boy called Shasta, who is a self-proclaimed the most unfortunate boy in the whole world. Nothing seems ever to have gone right uh, for him. And he's on a particularly lonely mountainside, just him and, and the horse. And Shasta becomes aware of the this presence by his side. At first Shasta thinks it's a ghost, uh, but it turns out to be Aslan, of course, the Christ figure in the Narnia series. And as the conversation goes, uh, Aslan makes this beautiful invitation to Shasta. He says, tell me your sorrows. And I think that's really important for us to remember. Uh, when we're going through tough times, it's so tempting to buy into the lie of the enemy and believe at some level that the Lord has lost interest in us or he's lost patience with us. And it's just not true. And if you're aware of people in your life right now, or maybe you will be aware of such people, in the future who seem to have gone lukewarm on the Lord uh, through a given set of circumstances or maybe turned their back entirely on the Lord because they feel that the Lord is against them for some reason. Their response is an emotional one so it's highly unlikely that you can appeal to them uh, on any uh, rational level. But I would encourage you to pray for such people 
that the Holy Spirit would mercifully enter into that situation and help them to understand, give them a clarity of understanding that in times of crisis, when the metaphorical tide seems always to be turning against you, it's the very time when Jesus wants to move close and for us to press into him. So that brings us to the end of uh, our study of Hebrews 3 and 4. Um, if you have any questions uh, that you'd like me to uh, talk about uh, and, and answer if I can, please feel free to contact me, uh, G. Alcott at stmarksepiscopal.com or you can call me on my cell phone 770-596-2243. Nothing delights me more than to uh, talk about God's word and, and find out what this, this beautiful word, this living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword word uh, might be doing in your life and mine. Because I do believe uh, that one of the things God calls us to, and we'll see this as we go through Hebrews uh, a little further, he calls us to be intentional about community, to exhort one another and to encourage one another uh, to continue our journey into Christ-likeness. So thank you for being with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, we will look at chapters 5 and 6 next week, and I'm just going to close us in prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, again for this written word, this powerful word, this living word. And thank you again for your word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Help us to remember, God, that you do offer rest. You offer Sabbath rest. You offer the rest that comes from being at peace, trusting that you have us where you want us for this particular day. But we also acknowledge, God, that there's an ultimate rest that you are calling us to, which should carry the, the thumbprints, the, the hallmarks of eternity in our lives uh, here today. Empower us by your Holy Spirit to live into these truths. Keep us in your way, God, and uh, inspire us with this uh, vocational call to grow in our likeness of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray.